Hi, my name is Lynn Watson. I'm a deacon at Halstead Road Baptist Church. I'm also the adult men's Sunday school teacher. And today we're going to learn how Jesus taught about prayer. And it's found in Luke 11, 1 through 13, and 18, 1 through 8. Now, Jesus taught us to pray with dependence on God, recognizing our physical and spiritual needs that only He can supply, with faith in God, knowing He is our good and loving Father, and with persistence to God, remembering He is just. It's as it's through the death and resurrection of Jesus that we have access to the Father so that we can pray in faith. It's amazing to watch children as they learn to communicate. They go from babbling to a few simple words to a full sentence seemingly overnight. From ball to my ball. I want to play ball. I want that ball, please. Soon it's a normal part of their everyday learning. Learning to pray is just like that. What are some ways growing in prayer is like growing in communication as a child? Well, sometimes we don't know what to say or how to say it. The more we grow as Christians, the more comfortable we should be going to God in prayer. We learn about prayer from listening to others, especially Jesus and by practicing. Prayer is like communication with parents who want us to learn and grow and be able to communicate better. As children, we start out with a limited vocabulary, then to entering into conversation. It's the same with prayer. We don't know much about God at first, but as we read his word, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit we begin to understand and grow more and more. Thankfully, we don't have to learn to pray in a vacuum. Uh, in Luke 11, 1 through 4, it says, He was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. He said to them, Whenever you pray, say, Father, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone in debt to us. And do not bring us into temptation. Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. The first, things he, the first thing he tells them is to, to do is to recall God's glory and holiness, that he would be honored as holy. God's kingdom and his will, which reflect his glory and holiness, are foremost on Jesus' mind, as they should be foremost on all of ours. Without a firm belief in the fact that God's glory and holiness matter, our prayers are for naught. Jesus tells us to acknowledge the glory of God, not because it's predicated upon our acknowledgement, but because prayers rely wholly upon his glory. Before we ask God for a single thing, we need to be aware that he is already the giver of everything. His kingdom is coming and his will will be done. We also need to acknowledge God's holiness. This is a reminder for us more than anything else that God is never less than holy. When we come before him, we are coming before the one who is high above us, whose guiding hand has crafted the world we live in since the dawn of time. Why should God's glory and holiness matter for our prayers? God's glory should be the ultimate focus and expectation of all our prayers. Our request in prayer should be consistent with God's holiness. We should be praying to reflect 
God's holiness in our lives. So God receives glory from us, and through us, we should become humbly, humble in prayer before the most glorious God, who is the most holy God. Jesus' model prayer teaches us that God is concerned with both of our physical and spiritual needs through three simple requests for bread, for forgiveness, and for protection. Jesus captures our physical and spiritual needs and reminds us to relay, rely on the God who sustains us in all of them. God cares intimately for each one of us every in every minuscule part of our daily lives both physically and spiritually so of course we can depend on him when we pray to God we can pray for our daily bread because it is his concern Matthew 6 19 through 34 tells us he cares about how we, we how we will be fed and how will and how we will be clothed and how we will survive from day to day. God takes great interest in our physical needs. What are some reasons we struggle with dependence on God? Well, for sure, sin would be the first thing, followed closely by pride. You know, we don't trust Him to come through in the ways that we think He should. We don't pray and seek Him like we should. We don't think about God's promised provision, and so we live as if he doesn't care or even exist. Luke 11, 9 through 13 says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. Prayer is not a passive activity, but an active one. The language of seeking and knocking implies action and initiative, not just wishful thinking. Prayer then makes us an active participant in the plan that God has for us, not just wide-eyed bystanders. But the act of prayer also requires faith in our good God to know what is best for us, whether that is what we ask for or not. We live in a time when Christians must be wary of false teachers who proclaim that anything we ask for in prayer will be given to us, thus treating prayer like a magic trick or God like a genie. We must know that sometimes the answer to even our most earnest prayer is no. And we must trust that our God knows better than we do whenever that no is uttered. Just because God might say no does not mean that we shouldn't ask Him. God delights to show us His will through our prayers, not because we can make Him do whatever He wants, we want. He will always give an answer, even if it's not the answer you want to hear. Because we trust Him, we know that He will open the door to His good and gracious gifts. If those gifts are not what we imagined when we first asked, when we shrink back from going before the throne of God in prayer, we rob ourselves of participating in God's glorious plan of providing for us and beholding His glorious provision. We're sitting in the back row mindlessly scrolling through our phones when we have been offered a front row seat to observe and participate in the greatness of our God. 
Our prayer plays an active role in helping us view God as the giver of all good gifts. We need to take advantage of this beautiful opportunity to obey him. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he taught them to address God as Father. This was not an afterthought, but an encouragement to see God as just that, Father and Sustainer. Contrary to some fathers on earth who ignore and abuse their children, Jesus paints a picture of God as a good and loving Father who delights to give us good things the supreme gift he gives us is himself through the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches that although God has a plan for this world that he promises to fulfill, prayer is often the means God uses to accomplish his divine purpose. In this sense, it is true that prayer changes everything. And it is also true that God uses prayer to change our hearts so that our, our will comes in conformity with His. In Luke 18, 1 through 8, it says, Now He told them a parable of the need for them to pray always and not give up. There was a judge up in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people and a widow that in town that kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, listen to what the unjudged judge says, Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay in helping them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will find faith on earth. Jesus told a parable about a very familiar figure in Scripture, the widow. His overall point with this story was not about caring for widows or orphans. Jesus frames this parable so that the judge is not the hero of the story. The praiseworthy and victorious character is the widow who persistently approaches the judge to find justice for herself against her adversary. The Bible is full of instructions like those found in Deuteronomy 10:18 and 14.29, and in James 1.27, to care for the widow and the orphan, the unprotected and the undervalued members of society. This judge didn't care about people or their needs, but clearly God does. Why should Christians concern, be concerned with justice in the world? Well, because God is concerned with justice. Our proclamation of the gospel is backed up by our pursuit of justice and not hindered by inconsistent witnesses. So the systems of the world fulfill their God-given mandate to promote what is good and keep evil in check. Because we love our brothers and sisters in Christ, both at home and around the world, the widow received justice because of her persistent pleas, not because of the judge's character or compassion for that woman. This is where we get to the main point of the parable. More than justice for widows, Jesus was teaching us something about the God we serve. Jesus compared the unrighteous judge to his Father in heaven, the ultimate righteous judge. And the contrast was sharp. If the unjust judge gave justice because of the woman's persistence, then how much more will we, will we receive justice in response to our prayers because our judge stands ready and willing to help us? So be persistent in prayer. Now on a scale of 1 to 10, 
How would you rate the health of your own prayer life? What are some ways you need to pray for forgiveness of your sins? Knowing the Father stands ready to forgive because of Jesus. How can you be praying for your community with persistence and faith? And who will you be praying for to hear and believe in the gospel? I'd just like to go to prayer with you right now. Father, we pray that your name be honored on earth as it is in heaven. As we see your kingdom come to pass in the ministry of Jesus and the mission of his church, help us to see more clearly your generous heart toward us so that we might more earnestly ask, seek, and knock by your good gift of the Holy Spirit. Work in our hearts to pray earnestly that those around us might come to experience salvation in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.